It's the big show with me, Alex Belfield, talking to my favourite people, Alan Titchmosh. How are you? I'm all right, Alex. It's very sweet of you to say. What do you mean, all right? That's not a great endorsement, is it? I'm rudely well. (laughs) (laughs) Well, listen, we've caught up a few times this year. As I saw you at uh, Chelsea, you were looking good then. Uh, You were all dressed up in a suit. And uh, you've been ever so busy. And that chat show of yours, I rather like. It's interesting and it moves quickly. And uh, you have good guests on. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Yes, we won't detain you too long. If there's something on you don't like, wait, you know, rather like Frank Sinatra's and if you don't like the weather in Britain, wait a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's good because, I mean, you get the best of them, really, don't you? And that's always nice when people want to come on your show. Instead, unlike me, I have to beg and plead. Oh, no. I, mean, I think it's, it's the same everywhere, really. You just hope you get some decently engaging people. I mean, I'm not... You know, it's not so much just getting big names. It's getting people that are interesting. I mean, I had on uh, the other day um, the, the chap from Dominic Brunt, who's the Paddy the Vet in Emmerdale, you know, a soap actor, and sometimes you think, oh mm. gosh, another soap star. And Dominic was an absolute star. He was wonderfully funny and amusing and engaging. And it doesn't matter who they are, if they're good contributors and they're, they're, they're good fun and people want to watch them, then that's all you ask, really. It's just that they should be, they should be enjoyable. Do you enjoy doing it? Love it. I mean, I've always liked talking to folk and listening to folk, which I think is quite important in a chat show. Mm. It's not always your chat they want, it's your guests' chat. And I've always just been generally interested in people. So to get the opportunity, you know, at five o'clock every day to sit down for an hour and and have all kinds of different guests on, whether it's in the world of music or theatre or telly or whatever, is a great treat. How much of your day and week does it take up? Because obviously it's on every day at five o'clock. It is. It runs. It, well, it, it sort of started at the end of September and it runs until just before Christmas. So I sort of do three month chunks, and then I'm back again in March through to May. Um, so it, it sort of comes in seasons, um, which means that I can do the writing in between times and, and, and in the morning as well before I go in. Five o'clock is quite a nice time of day to work in that you can mm. get your you know your bits of co- correspondence and and columns and things written in the morning and then go in and and do the program of the day. And that pesky Paul O'Grady's not up again against you anymore so there no, is that no but I do get weakest link escape to the country and come dine with me which is quite they're quite tough <laughs> the thing is I think it's a, it's quite a, a tricky slot five o'clock actually because the people are very habit forming at that well at any time of day I suppose but particularly at five o'clock which is sort of tea time and shows like those that run all the year round are quite difficult when you're a three month or you know or a 12 week or you're mm. breaking into it and people say oh we always watch that at this time so my you know challenge is to, is to make well why don't you just kind of look at this, you know, at five o'clock on ITV. They've been trying different people out in your slot and also at three o'clock. Um, I think it proves how difficult it is to make yourself look comfortable on TV. I think it probably works in your favour, all these different people trying to fill in. Well, it's very nice of you to say. <laughs> I mean, I suppose I've been at it for quite a while now and I, I, I kind of know to be myself and not to put on the airs and graces and just enjoy it and try and let the guests speak, really. And just really try and give people an hour's worth of entertaining TV. Are there some guests, though, when it does go well, that you wish you'd got another half an hour to talk to them? <laughs> oh, yes, and that's quite frustrating. But then, you know, you get the odd one that you think, oh, gosh, another three minutes. Uh, but not many. Mm. <laughs> now and again. So I try not to leave the audience short-changed, but at the same time, perhaps just wanting a little bit more, because that mm. means that it's gone well. Had my hero on yesterday, one of them, uh, Michael Parkinson. He's got a new book out ah, at the moment. Yes, and yes. Uh, talking to interviewers is always a bit difficult because you know when I'm making my mistakes, don't you? No, but I think as interviewers, we would always rather interview than be interviewed yes. in that when you're being interviewed, you just hear yourself droning on. <laughs> Whereas you can let somebody else be interesting and uh, exciting, you know, when you're interviewing. We do this once a year where we do a proper interview and then I seem to meet you at all different things in between. Things that have happened in your year that we might not know about that are interesting. Has anything interesting happened this year, Alan Titchmarsh? Well, my eldest daughter got married, which was rather nice. Oh, there you so go. That was a domestic thing, but a lovely day in July. Very happy. Did you wear a hat? Uh, I wore a top hat and oh, tails, God. and we all Very looked nice. terribly smart. And we had the <laughs> reception in the garden, and the sun shone, and she's married a nice lad. So it's lovely. Very nice. I need to retire. I tell you why. I remember sat in the back of a car with you, driving from Leicester to Nottingham or something, and you were telling me that for the first time she'd got a boyfriend, and you didn't know whether to kill him or embrace it. <laughs> My God, these years keep flying by. <laughs> they do, they do. I'm not a grandfather yet, though, so that's the next. That's the next. Stuff. Hello, no next pressure. year's interview. <laughs> um, in terms of giving her away, did you see it as that or gaining a son? I think I, it was lovely because he's a lovely chap um, and, and in a way it is, you know, you are gaining a son in law. Um, 
it, on the day, it was just the most happy and delightful of days. It was very interesting. The following morning, the Sunday morning, I was sitting in the garden because it was sunny and again, sunny again, and, the, and I was sitting out there with a cup of coffee, and I suddenly had this great shaft of realization that I wouldn't be the first man she rang, mm -hmm. and that's a little moment. But it's 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 the way of life, and uh, you know you you have to get used to it. But so it's a kind of bittersweet in a way but it, that, that's 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 the way of the world do you still have a garden do you do gardening anymore by the oh, way oh I do I get mucky every day when I'm at <laughs> home yeah? and I always go out every morning before I if I have to leave and go and do telly or whatever to have a look at it and prowl around like, oh, I'm just going to look around <laughs> the estate um, and no of course I do I mean I still write about gardening every week I know it's your big passion. What is more entertaining for you now, getting in the garden, sitting, looking at it, or still doing it? Hmm. Oh, you can't sit. Any garden, I can't. You can go into your garden with the intention of sitting. And if I last 15 <laughs> seconds, I'm, I'm so working on 30 seconds. I'm really working hard to build it up. Because you'll see something as he's nipping off or pulling up or... or poking around a bit or whatever and that's the delight of it really is pottering gardening mm. is for potterers it's bliss have you worked out how much you spend every year on these plants because i was talking to my aunt Marge the other day i mean even in her little garden at the front she spends about 100 quid could be expensive can't it i haven't dared you know it's best not to tot up things like that but then you know you work out what people will pay for a fitted kitchen <laughs> and then you say you know, they wouldn't spend a tenth of that on their garden it gives them every bit as much pleasure so hang on mrs titchmarsh can get a new kitchen as long as you can have your garden yep that's the deal is that's it? the deal you've got a brand new book out it's called when i was a nipper i mean last year you were on with your note but a lad and every year you find one of these books how do you keep having these thoughts to come up with material well i rely on publishers to have thoughts as well which is very nice i said would you like to do one on and i said well well do you think we could and, and eventually you're sort of guessing oh yes okay right i'll go that and Nobber to Lad was about growing up in Yorkshire and a childhood, but my childhood. And When I Was a Nipper is about life in the 50s. So my life is just a thread through it. But it's it's what it was like being alive in the 50s, if you like, whatever age you were, whether it was being a teddy boy or a girl in a milk bar or, or being a child or down on the farm or going on holiday with a bucket and spade. It's about life as it was then. And it's this one's illustrations on every page. It's packed full of reminders of things like Omo washing powder and Oxydol and uh, <laughs> uh, knicker elastic and stuff. So it, whenever I've given it to anyone, they say, oh my goodness, oh, do you remember? So that's great, you know, when people have triggered their memory. Is really. You're right, it is beautifully illustrated. It must have taken someone forever. What do you do then? Do you give them the thoughts and put your bits in and then they have to sort it all out? Well, they get the copy. I, I do all the, the, the words, you know, do, give them the copy and, and I gave them obviously some pictures from my childhood scrapbook of me growing up and what life was like around my family but then they got hundreds more of all kinds of things from the m1 with four cars on it when it was opened <laughs> <laughs> to you know boots the chemist in ludlow as it was then so it's just packed full of well it's nostalgia but in a way it sort of points up where we've come from mm. and i think that's quite useful do you ever lie in bed in a morning when the alarm goes off and wonder why you? Why are people curious to switch you on the telly or to buy a book and read it? I think I wake up every morning and think, today they won't, mm. to be absolutely honest, if I'm being really honest with you, because you think, they must have got fed up by now. You know, I mean, and you know, you, every time you write a new book or you do a new programme, you, I don't mean eaten away with worry in a paranoid way, but you are concerned not to outstay your welcome and, and to at least provide something which is entertaining or engaging, whatever. I don't mind, not everybody's going to like you, you've got to get used to that. You know, some people, you'll irritate the pants off them. As long as you don't bore them to death, I think that's the thing, or embarrass Embarrass them. Those are the two things. You, and yeah. there's, there's, aren't you, you're boring and you're embarrassing. Clear off. I'll go. <laughs> Believe me, Yikes, I will go. <laughs> I was just looking on the internet this week, and the last thing, by the way, you should ever do is Google yourself because then you open yourself up to all your critics. Do you avoid that stuff and think, but no, that's not me. That's not the person I am. Yes, I do. I've, I avoid it much more than I used to. If somebody says, oh, there was a piece about you in the Daily Whatever, I won't go and buy it now. I used to. It used to be kind of rather like picking a scab. You know, you can't resist it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't now. If it's, you think, oh, look, you know, they're entitled to their opinion. As I say, not everybody's going to like you. And I don't Google myself now. Um, of course, you want, when you 
you know your job whether in my job's writing broadcasting um performing in, in that respect and telling people about gardening of course you you want to be liked it's in everybody's nature to be liked admired mm. respected or whatever and it's a sadness when when you get somebody who, who doesn't but a lot of the time you look at what you know if you do happen to see what they've written you're reading the paper and you come across something you think well Clearly, they just want an angle, and they might not even believe what they're writing. They're just making mileage out of it. And you think, well, you know, if you can't stand the heat, keep out the kitchen. You've just got to get yeah. used to it. And, of course, the TV show. I watch that programme sometimes and think, if my editor was to be responsible for that and I was doing it on my radio station, I'd be in big bother. You do push it sometimes, don't you? <laughs> well, it's, you know, it doesn't maybe sail near the wind slightly, but I try and remember it's at five o'clock. You know, we try and be a bit careful. And, uh, but I think I like to try and amuse and just... Well, I suppose slightly push the boundaries. <laughs> it's tough sometimes when those double entendres are put in front of you. It's it's hard, isn't it? Not to not you know you want to whip it out and give it to your audience. Well, then <laughs> very much like that. Yes, <laughs> it depends which way you take. It. Is it a double entendre? Is a double entendre? And they're never salacious or I think in bad taste. They might yes. sometimes be a little saucy, but I think there's nothing wrong with that from a man who has spent his life pollinating plants. Mm. And you make it look very normal when you meet the big stars who occasionally come on your program. Let's face it, we get those who pop through the door every six months. And and it's nice to meet them, but um, occasionally it'll be a thrill when you meet somebody who you admire. H- how do you make that normal? Have you found the technique so that it's not uncomfortable? Because we don't want to see that, do we? Yes, well, I, I did 10 years of Pebble Mill, you know, back in the 80s and 90s of, of, of doing exactly that and meeting stars. And, and I learned pretty early on that if you're either sycophantic and fawning or overawed by their presence, it makes for a bad interview and therefore bad telly. So you do kind of... I've met an awful lot of people now over the years, and, and there are people I am hugely impressed with and in whose company I'm delighted to be but you just try and keep yourself measured and pleasant and keep your eye on the ball and on and on, on, on the, the job in question and, and get a good interview out of mm. them I think it's 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 a mistake to be overly personal with them or to expect everybody who comes on to end up being your bosom pal you want to get on with them affably but really my job there is to show them off so they they produce an entertaining conversation is there anybody left that you haven't met yet that you'd love to do who's still around well there's one i'm never likely to get which is maggie smith because she doesn't do interviews and Mm. i suspect therefore if she did it probably wouldn't go awfully well because she'd be reluctant um so i've always i did meet her once and that was a great treat it was just just nice to bump into and and i said something to her and she said yes but i'm not digging so (laughs) so she's not a gardener (laughs) but i've met folk who, who who are here you know the likes of alan bennett and i remember years ago interviewing Dirk Bogard whom I greatly admired and and, and I know Alan Alan that is, a, is a friend uh, but uh, Dirk Bogard was an acquaintance but it was just an extremely good interview in that he was forthcoming and, and I enjoyed the conversation and I think that's what you and you get most out of on the show how whether it's a famous person or someone who isn't terribly well known you just want a bit of good natter you know i was told by parker yesterday that david frost will say when you're on the phone i'll have to go because barack's on the line are you a number swapper are you are you in with the celebs do you try and be friends no, I mean I think I've. Only, I mean I mentioned Alan, but he's one of very, very few. I've perhaps got three or four people who are friends, who I'd regard as as co- close friends in the business. Most of my friends I've had for thirty, forty years, and they're people that I met in my twenties when I moved down south, mm-hmm. and who, you know, I, I married one of them, and and we've got a fairly tight group of friends. So not I'm I'm not a red carpet man. I don't particularly enjoy going to premieres, and I don't tout my family as props. So no, I'm a real person who happens to move in those circles and I'll get on with anybody and everybody from the butcher to the baker to the Hollywood star but generally speaking I think I'm probably more comfortable with the butcher and the baker yeah, what a shame I was going to ask you for your text number so we could you know tweet occasionally <laughs> or something I never have time to tweet no. I mean, <laughs> and who's interested in the variety of soup I'm eating some people might be and congratulations on giving the uh, the gorgeous Jane McDonald a gig because um, she was telling me last week she does Fridays with you and she's loving it that's she, nice she She's huge fun. It was very funny because Jane came on the first time she was on on a Friday. And, you know, coming from the same sort of part of the world as I do, coming from up there, I was aware at the end of the programme, and I said, well, Jane, you know, you don't have to be on your best behaviour on this programme. And I think rather like those was up there, when you go around to somebody's house that you've not been to before, you so, you know, you remember your serviette yes. and don't lift your little <laughs> finger up when you lift your cup. And I got the feeling on that first week that Jane was just sort of sizing me up and thinking, do I have to behave? Mm. And I said to her, and she came on the phone, Friday, Jane, just be yourself, it's fine. Yeah. 
and and we're away now and she's having a hope a whale of a time she's great company well and she'll say it as it is won't she and that's what you need on your program you You don't want want shrinking violets no 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 you don't want somebody who says yes no and thank you very much no it's participation again listen it's always nice to talk to you i suppose we'll meet again next year when you're uh granddad alan steady don't put any pressure <laughs> <laughs> Alan Titchmarsh lovely to talk to you as always When I Was a Nipper is the new book it's out now and uh, beautifully illustrated and uh, always entertaining as you are thanks for doing the programme again thanks Alex nice to be with you